Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us in the Synthetic Intelligence Forum. My name is Vic. I'm the founder and the host of the Synthetic Intelligence Forum. And today it's my sincere pleasure to welcome Dr. Christine Mushik from the University of Waterloo to talk to us about teaching quantum computers to simulate particle physics. Professor Mushik is a professor in the physics and astronomy department at the University of Waterloo. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mushik to the stream. Uh, hi, Dr. Mushik. Thank you for joining us today. Hello, thank you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And I'm looking forward to talking um, about one of my favorite topics. And as you said, it's about how to use quantum technology in order to learn about fundamental processes in nature. And yeah. I'm so with, without further ado, Dr. Mushik, I'd like to, uh, the, the slides are on, but before you go into the slides, if you can just give us a very brief overview of your background and sort of how you found yourself in this field, and then uh, and then please take us away with your slideshow. Thank you. Oh yeah, my background. Yeah, so my background is, um, so I'm here in Waterloo, and as you said, so um, I'm at the Institute for Quantum Computing. I'm leading the Quantum Interaction Theory Group. And actually, if you want to hear more about what our research is in more general, like you can look at our group webpage, the quantuminteractions.com webpage. And yeah, how did I get into this? Basically, um, I got intrigued very early by how one can make quantum algorithms that work on operational and conceptual and fundamental principles that are so different from um, yeah how we would write a protocol or how we would do an algorithm um, for a traditional computer program and like how this really can have um, advantages and can go well beyond the um, capabilities that you could have with ordinary uh, computing approaches. And in the beginning, I was mostly working uh, in the space of yeah, applying quantum algorithms in general, also quantum networking, quantum metrology. And then at some point, um, yeah, I found my passion in applying those quantum technology concepts in order to really learn about um, what nature does at its most fundamental core, like really how the elementary um, particles and um, the fundamental particles like quarks and gluons really interact. And because there is really a lot very unknown, so there are like big open puzzles in fundamental science. And I was very intrigued that quantum technology in principle offers a big scientific opportunity to um, yeah overcome the roadblocks that we're encountering at the moment. That, that's wonderful, Dr. Mushik. So the slides are on. I can see quantum interactions theory group. So take it away. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so before I go right into the depth of it, I really want to remind ourselves about the importance of numerical simulations, but also numerical simulations for quantum systems specifically. And this is just a reminder that if we know the fundamental laws of something, that's by far, by far really not identical to getting the answers to our burning questions. Yeah because to bridge this gap in general requires really complex simulations. So for instance, if you look at the standard model of particle physics, all the laws are laid out quite clearly yeah, in the standard model. But if you have a concrete question, like even something seemingly simple, like what is the mass of a proton or yeah, what happens inside a neutron star, maybe you want to know which composite objects or which particles are possible within the standard model or what happened at the early moments of the universe. Even so, you know, all the rules are like incredibly complicated and difficult to find the answers uh, to these questions. And we really need complex simulations in order to get our answers. And um, I really want to stress like the twofold importance here. So first, as we just said, the quest to understand the physics within the standard model of particle physics, like to understand which phenomena are possible at all that we see in our universe. But secondly, and perhaps even more intriguingly, to understand where our models fail. Yeah. So basically we make simulations and we can end up at a point where our simulations, which we trust, do not agree with our observations. And then it gets really exciting, yeah, because that's in a sense, yeah, the crack where the light comes through and where we can 
have the opportunity to discover new laws and develop new theories beyond the standard model and yeah really see new physics beyond um, what we see now but like even for getting towards this point of seeing and discovering new physics we really need the simulations first and so here i was talking specifically about fundamental particle interactions but um yeah, the importance of numerical simulations of quantum systems is really ubiquitous, no? So, for instance, take condensed matter physics, yeah? You know all the fundamental laws, <laughs> but if you want to devise a new material or you want to predict and design solids with certain properties, you really need these complex simulations um, in order yeah, to be successful at it. Or take quantum chemistry. Yeah, so the fundamental laws of quantum chemistry, known, yeah, totally known. But you have questions, for instance, for drug designs, like which types of molecules have the desired properties. And only because you know the laws, you don't know what you need to know for your drug design uh, problem. Yeah, and just to give you a hint of like how freaking difficult that is. So for instance, if you look here at my screen, simulating the penicillin molecule, to the accuracy that you need, yeah, um, just this quantum system per se requires a computer, would require a computer of the size of the visible universe. Yeah. And so why, why is this so hard? This is, here's the why, or rather it's a simplified argument or like a simplified illustration how numerical simulations of quantum systems, even so we really want them, quickly become infeasibly complex. Yeah, so because quantum systems, they can be, of course, in superposition states. And like, if you look at my first line here, if you have one spin, uh, one two level system, like one qubit, it can be in all possible superpositions between the states zero and one. So we have two basis states, we have two coefficients to describe that. So if you have two spins, yeah. Then you have all the options 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So you have four basis states to, to juggle, and you have now four coefficients to keep track of. And we immediately see how that scales because with three spins, you have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on and so forth. So you really see how the number of basis states or the number of possible states that your quantum many body system can be in really increases exponentially. You might want to think of um, the states being really the digital representation um, of the numbers. So 000 is a digital representation of 0, 0, 0, 001 is a 1, 0, 1, 0 is like the 2, 0, 1, 1 is a number 3, and so on and so forth. And with this argument, very easy to see that if you have capital N spins or capital N two level systems, you need in general two to the power of capital N numbers to write down the quantum states. So you have this exponential growth. And mind you, this is just writing down your state. Yeah, so you have not even done a calculation with it just yet. And to drive this message home even more clearly, the fact that quantum systems can be in these superposition states. And consequently, that we need so many numbers to write down the states is really growing um, and feasibly quickly. So if you look at 70 quantum particles, which is not a whole lot, then 2 to the power of 70, so that's already 10 to the 21 basis states. Okay? Or let's take 300 quantum particles, because 300, so look at my cube, that's just a 7 times 7 times 7 cube. That's not a terribly large system, no? But if all these seven times seven times seven um, building blocks were like quantum systems, so two-level quantum systems, you would have 10 to the 90 basis states. And yeah, that's more basis states than you have atoms in our observable universe. Yeah, and so that's the trouble. Yeah, and but it's this key point of trouble. It's an excellent opportunity to bring on one of my favorite quotes, it's a quote by Richard Feynman, who just said bluntly, nature is quantum, God damn it. So if we want to simulate it, we need a quantum computer. Yeah. So and basically a quantum computer really means using a controlled quantum system for computation because this quantum system, which you have control over and which you can use for your computation, 
it can be in superposition states itself. Yeah. And um, yeah, this is an opportunity to making the storing and processing of quantum states efficient. So in a sense, you could say you have a quantum problem yeah, you have a problem which can be in superposition state, but your computer device is also having quantum properties like your the quantumness of your computing device matches the quantumness of your problem. And this is when you start being in business. Yeah. And this is a very general observation. So what I wanted to say here, yeah, match the quantumness of your problem with the quantumness of your computing device. So this applies, oh my God, to like such a range, vast range of problems because, yeah, the need for numerical simulations of quantum system is just so ubiquitous. But I'm now going to zoom in onto a specific class of problem, which is quantum simulations, specifically for particle physics. Yeah? So particle physics, um, yeah, it's already um, very well established. And of course, traditional lattice gauge theory is an incredibly um, successful field where it is prioritized by some time. You use a very successful path integral formalism, and then you use like huge, huge supercomputers, classical supercomputers to run Monte Carlo method. And it's like immensely successful classical approach. And you could even argue that given the quantumness of your problem, like the problem being describing how fundamental particles interact, since the problem is so quantum, it's even a bit surprising, at least to me, that this traditional lattice cage theory is so successful. Despite this success, this traditional lattice gauge theory also has um, its limit. No? So there are wide problem classes which are completely inaccessible to traditional lattice gauge theory. So for instance, here on the left, topological terms. So these are problems uh, that are related to fundamental symmetries, like for instance, why is there more matter than antimatter in the universe? Like why are we here? Yeah, just made of matter. Um, also, real-time evolution. So everything that's a dynamical process like time evolutions also inaccessible to a traditional lattice gauge theory. So because it has a so-called sign problem, all three categories have so-called sign problems, which means you cannot even begin, you cannot even begin to tackle these problems at the moment of the existing methods or chemical potentials. Chemical potential is being just a fancy word for saying you have a process which doesn't happen like in vacuum, but which happens with matter in the background, like also problems with high matter densities like in a neutron star, for instance. And so, as you can see, these are big problem classes in modern physics, and we have no way of even getting started with them. Yeah, so for instance, if you have a dynamical process in a gauge theory of finite matter density, um, yeah, of course, I cannot answer it on my computer. No, um, even if I send it to Compute Canada, it's what I would do so here sitting in Waterloo. But no, um, so even if you send it to the big frontier, computer. No, and not even if I were, I can't, but if I could send it to the planned Aurora computer, which is a supercomputer of the future, then even then these future supercomputing centers that mankind is only going to build, even then um, these problems could not be addressed. And it's really intriguing and exciting that quantum computers don't have a fundamental conceptual roadblock here. So this is really a way out. And so here's the timeline, timeline very much from my perspective on quantum simulations, specifically for the field of gauge series for particle physics. So if you look um, on the very left, so there we have 2005 early, very visionary theory proposals where people were thinking, ah, yeah, how could one use quantum technology for these specific problems in uh, particle physics, and then here fast forward 2016, that was the first experimental experimental demonstration of the digital quantum simulation of the lattice gauge theory. And I will give a bit more detail on our work in this here um, on the next slide, but then here's a, again a big fast forward, because since this first experimental demonstration, there's like many, many more exciting experiments, like really on very different platforms, the field almost exploded. And now it's a highly active field, a dedicated conferences, dedicated funding scheme, special issues. So there's a lot going on in the space of quantum simulations for gauge series 
for particle physics specifically. And yeah, so here, as promised, I'm giving some details on the 2016 experiment. Um, so here we looked at the real-time dynamics. So recall that's one of the things that traditional approaches struggle with, and we did it on a few qubit quantum computer. Few qubit in this case back in 2016 was only four trapped ions. And here we simulated, for instance, how electrons positron pair, electron positron pairs uh, can be um, can be created out of the vacuum. And yeah, so that was uh, successful. We were very happy about it. Um, quantum simulations in this area quickly grew. So for instance, in 2019, we had um, a similar experiment, but extending to 20 ions already. And um, yeah, even so, I was extremely happy with um, these accomplishments. I also want to point out an important limitation that we had back in the time, because the specific model that we looked at was um, quantum electrodynamics. I mean, one dimensional quantum electrodynamics even, but the theory which describes interaction of charged particles through light. And this is a so-called abelian gauge theory. So for this, I want to explain that these gauge theories, so these theories which are really the backbone of the standard model of particle physics, so these gauge theories that help us to understand how fundamental particles interact, they come in two flavors. So there's a abelian flavor that we looked at in 2016 and 2019 and there's a non-abelian flavor. So how are they different? So as I said, these abelian theories, for instance, are very good and perfect for explaining electrical forces, like, for instance, electrons and positrons uh, attract each other. But <laughs> these abelian theories, they cannot even explain something as simple as the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. Yeah, so even if you want to explain what a proton is, an abelian theory will not be able to do that for you. In order to do that, you really need to move to this more complicated type of theory, non-abelian theories. And yeah, so this is more widely applicable. So for instance, it helps you to explain so-called baryons, like protons and neutrons, like composite objects that consist of matter only. And since you really need non-abelian gauge theories to explain yeah, protons and neutrons, the ability to really simulate a non-abelian gauge theory is really absolutely key to unlock the potential of quantum computing or quantum simulations for gauge theories. And this is just another slide to drive this message home. So to describe stable matter as we know it, and by stable matter, I mean, for instance, what you see on this picture, that's uh, a picture I took in a canoe in Algonquin Park, um, here in Canada. And yeah, just matter as we know it, matter in a canoe, in a tree, on a lake, matter that consists of matter only with no antimatter involved, it really requires non-abelian gauge theory. Because in an abelian gauge theory, if you want to make something composite that's stable, I would call it a gauge singlet, yeah? Um, so a state that nature allows, you always need as much matter as antimatter. So you can, for instance, combine an electron and positron together to form positronium, but it has as much matter as antimatter. However, if you have a non-abelian gauge theory, you can build a gauge singlet, like a allowed state that nature allows from matter only. Yeah. So for instance, how three quarks, no antiquarks, just the quarks, just the matter forms one baryon. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we embarked, my group and I, we embarked on this quest. Yeah, we embarked on the quest to sh simulate a non-abelian gauge theory and to really show how we can make simulate gauge singlets from matter only. And in 2021, so last year, um, we learned how to simulate two colors. So nature, quantum chromodynamics has three colors, but we take it step by step. So we did the first step in simulating only two colors. And so we simulated a baryon on a superconducting quantum simulator on IBM um, with two colors. So it was a non-abelian gauge theory. And so the aim of the game was really 
to go from the left side here on the left side it was our first stepping stone in a billing cage theory with no color so we went to our next stepping stone which is to go to a non-abelian gauge theory with two colors. And then of course you see already the third stepping stone where we actually want to be with three colors. So that is what we did in the year afterwards in 2022 and our collaboration. We made an experimental demonstration um, of the SU3 gauge theory, which really has all three colors and importantly has the correct gauge group of quantum chromodynamics that you want to have for simulating nature and we simulated gauge singlets as i said these are the states that nature really allows so these are color neutral objects involving all these three colors in one combination and um, yeah, that was quite a quest. Um, so basically how it works, just to give you a flavor, how does it look in practice if you want to teach a quantum computer to simulate uh, fundamental particle interaction? We start from our physics model. Yeah, so our physics model involving quarks and gluons. And then the first aim of the game is really to make an encoding. So we need to encode the model in a model that a quantum computer can understand. So the Hamiltonian formalism in terms of qubit, and you get, uh, yeah, you encode your problem in an exotic qubit Hamiltonian. And then this qubit Hamiltonian is very difficult to simulate. So the question is, how do you bring, how do you bring this to life? How do you implement that then? on the small quantum computers that we have today. yeah, Because in principle, there's this big promise of quantum computer, but in practice, you have only small and noisy quantum computers um, in the labs today. So we had to find a method in order um, to run this big problem on a near-term quantum device. And the method that we adopted, um, for instance, and most of our demonstration is a hybrid quantum classical simulation. So uh, let me explain a bit what I mean by hybrid quantum classical simulation and why my group is really focusing on developing new methods for hybrid quantum classical simulations. So these algorithm design elements we do even more broadly, like we applied for problems in um, particle physics, but they're applicable in a much wider sense even. Okay, but let me get started. What is the rationale behind this? So in a sense, quantum computers, or like the current quantum computers that we have in our labs today, are very much like toddlers or super toddlers. Yeah, it's a, um, you know, they are endowed with the super power in principle, but you also cannot help noticing that they're really small and you're quite sure they're going to make errors. Yeah. And I have to say this idea of um, comparing co quantum computers with toddlers was not my idea. It was a brilliant idea by Catherine Wright who wrote the APS uh, article um, <laughs> about um, this comparison. Even so she compares the quantum physicist who runs the quantum computers with the toddlers, uh, but never mind. Um, the key is really here, like they have, they're really full of potential, but they struggle also still. And so what is the reasonable thing to do? The reasonable thing to do with a toddler is to team them up with an adult, right? So that's exactly what we're doing is we're teaming up our toddler quantum computer with a grown up classical algorithm on a regular, fully developed, proper computer. And so how this looks in the end of the day is that we're often casting our problem in the form of an optimization problem. So finding the answer to our question is like really finding the optimal solution to this optimization problem. And yeah, so on the left side, you have like the adult, the optimization algorithm, which is running completely reliably on a classical computer. And then this optimization algorithm has to do a lot of cost function evaluations. And these cost function evaluations are done on the quantum processing unit. So you see the quantum processing unit or your quantum device is not responsible for running the entire show. It's really only taking over the parts that absolutely has to be quantum. 
Yeah? And the rest of the computation is completely relegated to the classical optimization algorithm. So how this really works in practice that my optimization algorithm is um, proposing a set of variational parameters. With these variational parameters, the cost function is evaluated. Um, then it's measured on the quantum device and the result is handed back to the classical computer who then continues with the optimization. In this way, the classical and the quantum computer work in a closed feedback loop. Yeah. And that actually is a scheme which is widely uh, successful, has been employed all over the world and really contributed to making a quantum proof of concept demonstrations um, applicable to a much wider range of um, problems. But coming back to our specific interests, so in our case, um, we are interested in um, quantum simulations of fundamental particle interactions and what my group and I were focusing on was really the simulations of gluons and quarks, like really um, getting everything in place such that you really have a simulation of dynamical matter, dy dynamical gauge fields, um, building on previous um, previous results, which only has both separately. And this is now actually for us not the end, it's just the beginning. Yeah? Because for us, having the gauge theory now in place, being able to simulate one baryon, it really is like a springboard, like we can take it from here. Yeah, From here, we can uh, really start developing algorithms for simulating real-time evolutions for topological terms. So if we know how to make a quantum simulation of one baryon, we can also make quantum simulations in future of a whole number of baryons so that we can have um, simulations in a finite matter density and then really work our way upwards towards this, um, towards these open problems. And so this already summarizes the key points that I wanted to make here. Um, so I'm recalling here that there are really vast problem classes in particle physics, as I said in the beginning, that are insurmountable for traditional approaches. So they're insurmountable for running these problems on classical computers with algorithms we know so far, but they're not insurmountable for quantum computers. And um, yeah, there are these examples like real-time evolutions or, as I said, high matter density. And I want to zoom in a little bit more on the second part of the high matter density. So for instance, if you look at this phase diagram, so if you look at the x-axis here, so you see the net baryon density, that's basically um, the... Um, chemical potential, yeah, the fermionic chemical potential. So higher density, higher matter density is to the right, lower matter density is to the left. And then on the y-axis, I have the temperature. So you see there is so much going on in this phase diagram. There is a lot of interesting physics. And so these bubbles tell you all the high energy physics experiment, which want to explore these regimes. And so for instance, here is an open question. Is there something like a color superconductor? Does nature even allow for that? And there's a lot of unanswered physics question here. But I want to draw your attention to the blue area, because the blue shaded area here is what traditional lattice QCD, what we have now, can simulate and tackle. And you see that's a preciously small part of this entire phase diagram, yeah? because if you have high temperature, you can make a perturbative expansion 1 over t. And like we can only look with our computers here. We can look nowhere here. And so this really... Um, gives us already a sense how powerful a quantum computer would be. So this is uh, taken from a YouTube video that an artist did about our work. So that was his imp um, artist's impression how a regular computer would give up by a quantum computer could go beyond these limitations. And it would really be very beneficial because just looking from the space diagram, you could answer questions in particle physics. Yeah, there are questions in nuclear physics that you can begin to answer, questions in cosmology and astrophysics, also condensed matter physics would be touched. And um, now I want to zoom out again. If you're able to address problems involving quantum particles, and if one can, for instance, make um, either purely quantum computations or hybrid quantum classical computation more successful, 
who will have a wide range of applications. Um, you can investigate applications for new materials, pharmaceuticals, fertilizers, batteries. And um, people also look into possibilities for carbon capture. And so I have here at the bottom an archive link um, uh, from a paper from a friend of mine. And the idea is really that instead of carrying out a lot of experiments for trying what a quantum system would do, you could really make computer simulations and um, do research like this. And to wrap up, I want to make a striking comparison that's motivating me. And it's about quantum enhanced computing and the vision that stands behind my work. And that's basically a reminder back in the time when we introduced uh, GPUs and scientific computing. yeah, Because what GPUs were doing is basically creating um, or giving more um, capabilities to the computational abilities, like basically accelerating simulations. And these accelerated simulations, which were afforded by the introduction of GPUs, they led to so many discoveries, yeah, because like astrophysics and nuclear physics, uh, yeah, of course, particle physics and biosimulations, biosimulations, yeah, it like really took off when people just had this accelerated simulation capabilities and um, could make new breakthroughs just because of that. And the hope or the dream is, is that similarly, like GPUs accelerated scientific computing back in the times, if you were able to have not a GPU, but a QPU, like a quantum coprocessing unit that can be incorporated and benefit your regular computing infrastructure, like putting it all together, could have a similar effect or could have a potentially even more pronounced effect leading to new discoveries. But this is so much in the beginning, there is so much unexplored uh, territory ahead. So we will have to see what time brings. And for now, I can just say uh, it's a very exciting journey. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. This was a very uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking uh, presentation. I have a few questions, if I may. And uh, one of the questions that comes up to mind is, uh, I, I recall when you talked about the hybrid classical and quantum computer configuration that you used for doing some of the simulation work. Uh, we know that even within the world of quantum computing, there are a couple of different models. I mean, most notably, we hear about quantum circuit-based systems. We hear about quantum annealing-based systems. So when in your setup, you were actually using the quantum computer to do loss function calculations, uh, just more broadly first, can you tell us a little bit about the broad differences between annealing type systems and these quantum circuit type systems and what the pros and cons are in different uses? Use cases and then which one you actually used in that uh, hybrid uh, configuration that you described? Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, so there, are, like as you said, there are like these different paradigms, and the most well known paradigm is, of course, the uh, circuit based paradigm. Um, and I think most people are most comfortable with that because you have a circuit with gates only instead of having classical gates, you have quantum gates. And like also big companies like uh, Google and IBM um, produce hardware, which allows you to run um, algorithms just um, with this circuit based model. And uh, yeah, that's also one of the benefits that it's like easy on the mind. Yeah, on the brain and also that it's so accessible. Yeah. So for instance, you can run your, like if you device a scheme in the uh, circuit based model, you can immediately go to a cloud based uh, platform and you can run your quantum algorithm immediately. And, but as you said, it's absolutely uh, not the only one. I mean, that's the one that we used also for our uh, hybrid simulations, but there are others around. And so you mentioned, for instance, the, um, annealing. So maybe I should explain the annealing first. So uh, the annealing is a completely different concept. There you have a problem. So you have an optimization problem and you encode it also in an exotic spin model and everything is done in such a way that the solution to your problem is in the ground state of your quantum system. So like the whole task of performing the computation 
is transformed into the task of shepherding um, your quantum system into the ground state. And so the ground state is basically your solution. That's what D-Wave does. So like my group and I, we are not doing that. But like these are not even the only two, like uh, gate-based and quantum annealing are not the only two. There are other others which are really very interested in, for instance, measurement-based. So for instance, my group and I, we use also a lot of measurement-based and we also married the approach of doing these variational quantum eigenservers, so doing this hybrid approach and the gate-based approach together. And that actually has big advantages. So let me quickly explain what um, measurement-based means. It's a completely different paradigm. Um, so measurement-based quantum computing means you start out with making a resource state. So you create a quantum resource state, which is highly entangled. And starting from that, you perform a lot of measurements on your state. And you carry out your computation by making the measurements. That's why it's called measurement-based quantum computation. Basically, performing the computation becomes a measurement pattern. And uh, so this is really in the very early beginning, um, like we, we were actually the first ones to propose even that you should combine hybrid computing, hybrid quantum classical computing with this measurement based approach. Oh, for completeness, let me just mention one more because uh, there's yet another paradigm how you could do quantum computing and that's dissipative quantum computing. And that's very different and it's very intriguing. So I have also worked in this, but this area is a bit underexplored um, still. And um, so in your gate-based approach, you have quantum gates. So these are unitary operations, um, but something that can happen to your quantum system, apart from that, is that your quantum system interacts with its environment and that's usually a problem. Yeah, and that's called dissipation. Your quantum system interacting with an environment, which is usually problematic, is called dissipation. But turns out you can use these dissipative processes in your favor. Yeah, you can use dissipative processes to do computing. Yeah, mm -hmm. not only computing, you can also use it for communication, quantum communication, quantum sensing, like for quantum information processing more general. And it's going to look very differently because these dissipative processes, they're random processes and they're always on, like it's very hard to switch them on and off. So your algorithm, if you use dissipative quantum computing, will look very differently, but it will also have different properties and it's very uh, intriguing. Yeah, and as you said, all the different approaches, gate-based or measurement-based or annealing or dissipative, they all have different uh, pros and cons. And my group and I, we used gate-based and measurement-based so far. Okay. Thank you, Christine. That's great. Uh, another question that comes to mind is, although your talk focused quite uh, quite a lot on quantum computing, but you also touched on quantum metrology. You talked more broadly about quantum networking as well. So can you talk a little bit about how advances in one of these fields leads to advances in other fields? So for instance, when there are breakthroughs in quantum metrology or quantum right. networking, how do they benefit each other? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Say that. Like, especially uh, quantum computing, quantum networking, and quantum metrology, that's measurements. There is such a huge potential for synergy. And, like, I could easily talk about this an entire hour. But let me just pick one. Yeah. So just my favorite. Uh, so a synergy between quantum computing and quantum metrology. So, for instance, in quantum computing, I need to keep my states coherent because if they are not coherent, um, yeah, that's a big challenge, which like really hampers like my success of my um, quantum computation the protocol per se. So this is why we have quantum error correction, quantum error correction to keep my states coherent and clean. So in quantum metrology, my aim is not to run an algorithm. My aim is to make high precision measurements but I have a similar problem because um, I need to keep my quantum states um, clean and pristine because um, in order to see my quantum advantage, uh, so to have the enhanced sensitivity and enhanced um, accuracy, usually I have to measure as long as I can. So the longer the measurement time, the higher the precision, the higher the accuracy. However, 
there's interaction with the environment, so which degrades my quantum state and leads to decoherence, so I accumulate noise. So if I measure longer and longer, I don't get better and better. On the contrary, I accumulate noise, and in the end, it's the only noise, so quantum advantage is gone. So what I can do is I can take um, the quantum error correction protocols that have been developed in the context of quantum computing, and I can use these quantum error correction protocols for stabilizing and correcting my quantum states that I use for sensing. Yeah. So what happens is that I have my quantum system for sensing and I correct it with quantum error correction, which means it stays coherent much longer. I can measure longer and I get a better sensitivity. So that's one favorite example of mine, how advances in quantum computing can benefit quantum metrology. Thank you, Christine. That's uh, that's excellent. Uh, one last question for you is uh, certainly in your research group as a scientist, you work with experts and people that understand the technology and the foundations to do a lot of this simulation and optimization work outside of research settings. When we have organization leaders in the public sector, in the private sector, and they want to harness uh, the power of quantum computing, what kind of advice would you give to them in terms of feasibility and viability? You talked about quantum computers sort of at the toddler stage currently. What, what kind of best practices would you share with them as they're evaluating and assessing applications of quantum computing in their organizations? I think I would advise three points. <laughs> so the first one is um, in the space of quantum, like, if I make decisions on how to move forward, I would really pay close attention to get my information really from reliable institutes and like also from researchers who have really a track record of expertise uh, in quantum, because like nowadays we're in a space where there are a lot of claims made from people who don't even have a background in quantum. Um, Secondly, it's, of course, very good to get um, input on important decisions from independent people. Yeah, so independent people um, who are not trying to sell something, but like who have really, um, who are able to give an objective opinion and a well-founded opinion. And the third thing is that as of now, like speaking now in 2022, I really believe that we're in exploration phase. Yeah, so because there are so many different approaches and it's really not clear yet which route will really take us to success. And there are so many fundamental concepts that we're still working on. And um, my advice would be to keep the mindset still open and uh, not to put all eggs in one particular basket. Thank you, Christine. That was uh, great, uh, great advice. And uh, it's, it's very great that when you talked about the idea of the complementarity, that there's uh, perhaps a whole talk in there. So on behalf of the forum, we'd love to invite you back in a couple of months uh, and uh, love to hear from you just on the details of those complementarities. But uh, really, thank you very much, Christine, for sharing your insight and your foresight about such a fast evolving and rapidly advancing topic. So again, we'd love to have you back uh, in, in the future and uh, to come and share your knowledge with the Synthetic Intelligence Forum community. But for today, Thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.